Hello and welcome to ReBank. I'm your host, Will Beeson. Dan Kimmerling is founder and managing partner at Decians, an early stage fintech VC and backer of Tripper Cash, Treasury Prime, and many others. Prior to starting Decians, Dan co founded Standard Treasury and served as its CEO until its acquisition by Silicon Valley Bank. Standard Treasury was one of the earliest players in what has evolved into the banking as a service segment. It was backed by Y Combinator, Andreessen Horowitz, and Index Ventures. After the acquisition, Dan led API banking and open platforms at SVB. In this conversation, Dan and I discussed the strategy of concentrated bets, why he doesn't want to see every deal, what's next in startup funding, value accrual in AI, and more. Thank you very much for joining us today. Please welcome Dan Kimmerling. Dan Kimmerling, welcome to ReBank. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, likewise, likewise. Uh, really nice to chat with you. You, in one of your written pieces, characterized a misguided belief about venture, that there is little that a venture capitalist can do to substantively change the trajectory of a company's outcome. And based on what I've uh, learned about Decians, you have a different view. And in fact, being impactful to influence the trajectory of the companies you invest in seems to be core to your value proposition. So I wonder if you could kind of unpack that statement, both what most VCs get wrong and how you think about things differently. Well, thank you so much for having us here. I think the thing I would just say is, it's like a question of one's ethos or way of being in the world. At Decians, we would rather do far fewer deals deploy far fewer dollars, raise far fewer dollars, and then spend most of our time helping people build really important companies versus I think many other venture capital firms have really this idea that they should raise and deploy as many dollars as possible. The volume, the velocity of capital raising and deploying should be as high as possible. And therefore, things which are which impede that should be minimized, engineered out, optimized around, and so on and so forth. And for better or worse, one of those things is working with portfolio companies. <laughs> and so that's one way of thinking about it. My partner, Ishan, if he were here, he would say that if we do our job right, retrospectively, entrepreneurs should think of Decians as their third co-founder or fourth co-founder, however many co-founders they have, Decian should be the N plus one co-founder. And that's really what we strive for. I think the the economics of venture in general would kind of support the counter example that you gave to your philosophy, which is basically try to raise and deploy as quickly as possible because you earn a management fee on all your uh, assets under management, i.e. the size of your funds. And that allows you to build a platform or infrastructure, hire people, analysts, see more deals. Isn't that kind of the counterexample? One thing I would say is in general, venture capitalists collect fees not on AUM, but on committed capital, which is a related but different measure. What you just said, there is a real strong logic there, a very strong commercial logic. And that logic encourages a transactional and industrial way of being. It encourages a firm with lots of layers and lots of activity, for sure. I get it, 110%. We are really fighting that. We are really, really fighting for a artisanal, relational approach to venture capital, which is really a hearkening back to an older style of venture capital, which at its heart had a fight for carry, you know, profit sharing, rather than a fight for fees or fee generation. And I think this kind of dovetails into the other side of your philosophy, which is to make a smaller number of very concentrated bets rather than looking to diversify across themes. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how the two work hand in hand. 
and ultimately what you as an investor are optimizing for? If you want to engage with companies in the way we want to engage in this kind of like extremely fulsome capacity, you can't do that with a bajillion companies. You have to be focused and concentrated and so on and so forth. And so having a highly concentrated approach where we get very hands on, those things tend to go very well together. And it means that we have to keep our funds modest in scale because we can't do that many deals because we spend a lot of time with each company. So our fund size and our team sizes are modest. But I think it even goes a step deeper. When I, uh, your audience may know that I had started this company, Standard Treasury, and, and we raised money from some very high profile venture capitalists. But the reality is in very large firms and very large funds, any given investment doesn't really matter. It's only the very, very few investments that will actually generate meaningful economic returns that ultimately matter to the firm's success and longevity. I don't want entrepreneurs to ever think that they don't matter to us. I think that that's a very transactional way of being, right? Like when you have a highly concentrated portfolio, every single entrepreneur matters. Every single deal matters. There are no, as they say in the business, flyers. And that that ethos, that way of being means that there's very high opportunity costs for us to do a deal. And so we have to make sure that we're really, really committed to a fulsome due diligence process and that these partnerships are just indelible. And so I think that's a lot of why we work the way we work. Now, you were asking a question kind of around as an investment manager, what is it that we're trying to achieve? And I think, you know, we wrote about this a, a couple of months ago, that we want Desians to be the get rich or die trying venture firm. We either want to be great or we want to go find the new career. Being good enough to kind of just skate by, that doesn't seem very emotionally satisfying to me. And ultimately, what that means for a venture investor is return on capital. In the fullness of time, we will be measured on what is generally called MOIC, M-O-I-C, multiple of invested capital. For every dollar our investor gives us, how many dollars do we hand back to them net of fees and carry? That's the number one. The second measure would be internal rate of return or IRR, which is you basically take the MOC and you look at when the investors gave you those dollars and when you handed those dollars back. Basically how long the money was locked up in order to achieve the absolute return. What is the rate of return based on how much you've returned and the specific timing of that? How much of your philosophy is informed by your experience as a founder? I think a lot of my philosophy as an investor comes from, obviously, my education at the University of Chicago, where, amongst other things, I, I was in the analytic finance, quantitative finance program. Being an entrepreneur, having been an executive at Silicon Valley Bank for a number of years as well, having been an angel investor in over 40 companies, before I started working on Desians in a fulsome way. So I think there were like a lot of different things that informed me. But I think more than anything, it's just really trying to think about the world from a set of first principles. Like, what are our goals? What are the strategies that we can use to achieve those goals? What are the tactics that drive those strategies? And how do we do it in a way that creates a long-term sustainable competitive advantage for ourselves and our client rather than kind of just being uh, proverbial flashes in the pan. At Standard Treasury, are there specific examples of how your investors helped you in a tangible way? I'm sure the answer is yes, but it's over a decade now. Effectively, what I want to get at is how you because I do understand that it's core to your approach at Decians, how you look to work hands-on with the founders that you back. A lot of investors talk about that, right? It's like one of the top bullet points of every investor's value prop. 
the way I hear you talk about it suggests that either one, it's more meaningful to you, or two, you actually do it differently or more deeply than some others. Ultimately, we want to be true partners with founders, true partners, to such a degree that they consider us their third co-founder. What that means is that the engagement is often very unstructured. While we've been on this podcast, I got a text from one of my founders. Do you have time to talk today? I have no idea what we are going to talk about. But like most days, most of the time, I'm working with one or more of our founding teams to try and help them achieve their ambitions. I'm either trying to coach them through a problem, help them come up with a solution to a problem. There are general patterns like capital, hiring, product, distribution, and so on. But everything is different. Part of the artisanal relational approach to venture capital is we don't have to be like a factory. right? Whatever this founder needs, we're going to do our best to give it to her. I know my colleague Vishal was just on the phone with another one of our founders. Whatever that founder needs, we're going to do our best to help him achieve it. It's one of the reasons we don't necessarily think about portfolio support as a program. It's not like a boot camp. We have people in our community, for example, that can help us with engineering, product management, design, and we can do some of that ourselves, et cetera. But ultimately, it's not about being like a factory. It's much more about crafting one day at a time with founders. Last point, maybe on the ethos, and we kind of touched on it earlier, but I think it's pretty clear that you have, again, a sort of countercultural almost approach to investing in that your goal is not to see every deal and get allocation in the quote unquote best deals, but rather that you think about things differently and you're neither structured to see every deal nor do you desire to, yet you expect to make excellent returns on capital. I think a big thing with this is when you're working with two people on a PowerPoint deck, which is usually the stage we start engaging with people, I think it's very hard to be able to donate the quote-unquote best deals from others. And when you do that donation, it's more about how well the founder can sell their idea than about the idea itself, or let's be honest, the implementation of the, the idea. Hot seed deals, so, so to speak, we think are a bit of an anathema. A hot seed deal, those words are contradictory. That doesn't compute to me. So it's not about, quote unquote, being in hot seed deals. It's more about helping people go from zero to one. So that's the first thing. I think the second thing is, as a small firm, you know, we're seven people. As a small firm, you really have to pick your spots. You cannot behave in the same way as your larger, better resourced, more traditional competitors. Warren Buffett said that the best way to be Bobby Fischer is to play him in any game but chess. And you know, there are so many great venture capital firms out there, but they all kind of use this sort of traditional playbook. And if we use that playbook, we would just be massacred because we're not nearly as large as a resource and so on and so forth. And so really what it is, is it's about like creating an alternative playbook where their scale, resources, and so on are not competitive advantages. And really, I think our playbook, we've written about it, talked about it extensively at Destians.com, smallness may actually be a virtue to the effectiveness of our playbook. Whereas like the scale and resourcing tends to be a virtue of the other point. You wrote that 2023 was a year in which you were heads down and strategically focused, making big moves. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. You know, last year we did a, a number of things. The most important thing is we spent most of the year helping our portfolio. We're in financial services and financial services venture capital is going through quite a, a reset. We spent a lot of time with our portfolio helping them adapt to this new reality. 
And I think some of those moves have been reported on and some of them haven't, but they will in the fullness of time. And then I think when I think about our team and what we're doing at Desians, some of the things I can talk about are we brought on our partner, Vishal. That was a critical move. We hosted our first major summit, Desians Connect. We traveled around the world, spending lots of time with our partners and collaborators, portfolio companies and the like, and a number of other things which we're not quite ready to talk about, but we will in a couple months. Last year was really about coming to grips with what this new reality is and positioning ourselves and our portfolio and our organization to be successful. You talked about some things having been reported on when it comes to your portfolio companies. Are you talking about things like... I'll give you... Yeah, please, please. As an example, our portfolio company, Chipper Cash, released Chipper ID, Chipper for Business. Those are some major initiatives that they've been openly talking about. With our portfolio company, Treasury Prime, it's one bank and one key model to multi-bank partnership. That's been a big thing that they've talked about, and so on and so forth. But I think one of the things is that I think people who don't do startups for a living have this idea that like you have an idea today and you launch it next week and it's in the paper. It's February 16th of 2024. The reality is that if you want to ship something this year, you got to be working on it now. Because if you got to hire somebody to own that, they have to be in that seat by the end of May, maybe June. And that means you got to write a job spec, get candidates, interview, make an offer, have that offer accepted, et cetera. And so things that we worked on last year probably will be announced in the back half of this year. It's very, very, very rare that something can go from an idea to in the press overnight, so to speak, unless there's a very unusual configuration of facts that let that happen. Sounds like many of those things that you just mentioned are new initiatives, new products. How much of the work that you've been doing with your portfolio companies over the past, say, you know, 12 months has been around either organizational restructuring or capital efficiency or focus on profitability, things like that? All of those things, to me, fall under what we call financing risk. When we invest in a company, we try and think about what are all of the things, risks that the company has, and how do we de-risk them systematically? All the companies we work with have what we call existential financing risk. If they cannot raise more money, then they will go out of business. And therefore, you know, the financing risk is existential. In 2021, early 22, the way you handled existential financing risk was to grow sufficiently fast that financiers who wanted to back growth would be attracted to. Now in 23, 24, existential financing risk comes from needing financing at all. And so that is quite a dramatic shift, like 180 degrees. And that means oftentimes we have to restructure the team, which is terribly painful, as you must imagine, reprioritize projects, cut lines of business, cut geographies, reevaluate efficacy of certain go-to-market systems, and so on and so forth. As we would call it, go back to basic. I can't say that every one of our companies has had to go through that. But many of them certainly have. How would you characterize the state of the industry right now? Have the last three to six months been different in terms of top of funnel, deal flow, velocity of seed stage companies raising money? Have you felt any sort of change in tone across the fintech venture industry over the past handful of months? I mean, we continue to see incredible entrepreneurs want to create game-changing companies and financial services. That does not change. I think the question is, how does one do that within this new capital environment? And I think that there's a kind of realization, not just across fintech, 
but across the entire startup ecosystem. That man, this is hard and it takes a long time. Yeah, I was talking to a VC friend of mine and we were looking at some data and the data says that reasonably from when you get started to when you go public is 15 years, medium. I mean, it's 50% or longer than that. Part of the whole reset is a returning recognition that this is hard, really hard. A couple of immediate thoughts there, right? Because there's there's a lot of discussion now about how the existential risk related to funding is is the ability to ever be able to raise again. And I think that's pretty true of maybe less for seed stage, surely there, but certainly like A, B stage companies now. And at the same time, I imagine you're still looking to back visionary concepts, which can create tremendous impact on the world and also huge, ultimately, enterprise value. And it takes 15 years to free yourself from private market funding if you're a startup. In my mind, that means that one of two things need to happen. Either the market changes, you know, the world changes so much that this bootstrap to venture to subsequent venture rounds to IPO after 15 years model goes away, which I think is extremely unlikely, or we got to return to some semblance of what we'd call normalized venture activity. You hear a lot of people now talking about how venture is fundamentally changing. Founders are seeking less dependency on external capital. A lot of funds are closing their doors. A lot of LPs are rethinking allocations to venture. I think Sebastian Malaby in his book, The Power of Law, talks about this quite eloquently. That venture goes through these kind of boom and bust cycles. And we're living through one of them right now. And at least the, as I read Mr. Malaby, everyone always says that we need to blow the model up. I don't think that that's realistic. The model works. It just, it works over a long period of time through like a very volatile curve. If I were to like think about what needs to quote unquote change, I would maybe point to three things. The first thing is we have to get the IPO market reopened because that is what will give late stage financiers more confidence. And that's really where I think the system is quote unquote clogged right now. Late stage financiers don't want to do anything because companies aren't going public. Kind of works downstream. With less growth stage financing it's happening, less series C has happened, and then less series B, less series A, and so on. So we ultimately have to get either the IPO or MA market to reopen. One. Two, we have to train a generation of entrepreneurs, and this is part of our advocacy at Desiant that you want to build a company that can raise capital, but doesn't need to raise capital. The way we think about it is a company should raise capital or not, because that is the right thing to do for the company. It's the right structure, the right valuation, the right partner, and so on and so forth. Not needing to do it is the key. And I think creating optionality around it is key. That's the nuance. I think the third thing is we as an industry have made an, an error in removing small IPOs. A company with 100 to $200 million of revenue should, in my humble opinion, go public because it is ultimately better for all stakeholders. I'm sorry that my little dog has decided to say hi. I think it's ultimately better for all stakeholders. It is, I think, an unfortunate byproduct of the availability of large-scale growth capital that many of these companies are staying private. And we encourage our companies to think about early IPOs quite a bit because ultimately the public markets over some long period of time are a great allocator of capital. Maybe last topic we can cover today is AI. So I know you've been thinking a lot about AI recently. And 
you've written about how you view the importance of data strategies as growing. And you've also, I think, written about a reduced importance that you place on fundamental models, which have been the focus of a lot of enthusiasm and capital over the past year and a half at this point. Can you talk a little bit about where you see value accruing in AI, at least uh, through the lens of a seed investor like yourself? I think the most important thing to know is that I think AI is really cool. Like as a dweeb, I nerd out about it. But I'm not confident that startups and AI will make a buck. I try and in any conversation, I want to like be clear. It's really sexy. I dweeb out about it all the time. But as an investor who is a fiduciary for my clients and thinks a lot about how we're going to make money, that's like really the thing that I get I get unclear about. But I think they're just like broadly speaking, two things. First is a lot of AI startups have to spend tremendous amount of money on either buying their own compute, generally from NVIDIA, or they pay that to hyperscale compute platforms like AWS, Google Cloud Compute, and Microsoft Azure. So while they may be able to create a lot of revenue, they have very high costs. So their margins are thin, and they leak value to these hyperscale compute platforms or NVIDIA. That's the first thing. The second thing is, if you look at the history of computing, the development of free and open source software has been quite impactful, quite impactful. And my general sense is that will likely happen here. And you're already starting to see it with Facebook's approach to uh, their open source models. And so in a world where there's like free and open source software, it's hard to know who's going to ever accrue any value and therefore be able to capture it. And, you know, I think a lot of people really get into how cool it is for the dweebs out there. It's it's sexy, but, you know, it's different than can we make money as investors. Excellent. Dan, well, look, we could easily keep going. You're such an experienced guy with so many insights, but I want to be respectful of your time. It's been a great pleasure talking to you. Well, it's my pleasure, and I hope you and your audience uh, really enjoy it. Dan Kimmerling, thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks for tuning in to Rebank. If you like today's show, reach out. Follow us on Twitter at Rebank Podcast and join the conversation. For more on banking, fintech, and the future, check out our regular content at www.bankingthefuture.com.